The birth of Attis, like that of many other heroes, is said to have been miraculous. His mother, Nana, the daughter of the river Sangarius and the hermaphroditic Agdistus, was a virgin who conceived by putting a ripe almond in her bosom, which was from the almond tree, sprouted off the castrated male organ of Agdistus, eventually giving birth to Attis of Phrygia, and later, Nana abandoned baby Attis. But what happens when eternal love collides with the unforgiving hands of fate? Today we uncover the story of Attis and Sibylle, a saga where love and catastrophe are intricately linked in a complicated blend of mortal and celestial feelings. Welcome to the History Realm. Make sure you like the video to support the channel. Anyways, it starts in a kingdom located in what is now modern-day Turkey named Phrygia, a fertile ground for myths and deities that have stood the test of time. Extending from the Mediterranean seaboard to the far reaches of Anatolia, the land's diverse terrain of mountains, forests, and rivers serve to enhance both its agricultural prospects and its wealth of myths. The culture was a melting pot of indigenous beliefs mingled with influences from neighboring regions like Greece and Mesopotamia. Within this vibrant cultural mosaic, Sibylle emerged as a dominant figure. Known as the Mountain Mother, she was deeply revered as a goddess of fertility, nature, and wildlife. Her cult had a profound impact on Phrygian society, shaping its religious rites, festivals, and even its politics to some extent. Temples dedicated to Sibylle dotted the Phrygian landscape, serving as both religious centers and social hubs. To understand the story of Attis and Sibylle fully, one must first grasp the complex cultural and religious milieu from which it sprang. Sibylle traces her origins to the Phrygian earth goddess Matar. Cloaked in intricate robes and often depicted riding a lion-drawn chariot, her attributes represent the primal forces of nature. Fertility, wild animals, and mountains were all under her dominion. Revered not only in Phrygia but across the ancient Mediterranean world, her influence seeped into Greek, Roman, and even early Christian traditions. In Phrygia, she was the linchpin of religious life, with festivals like the Galli paying homage to her divine power. In Rome, she evolved into Magna Mater, and her cult became integral to the state's religious practice. On a side note, don't forget to tap the like button to support our the channel. All right, let's move on. Attis arrived in the world amid extraordinary circumstances. Legend tells us that a pomegranate tree, nourished by the spilled blood of a cruelly slain Agdistus, a primordial deity, grew at the spot. The nymph Nana took a fruit from this tree, and miraculously, Attis was born. Radiating beauty and charm from infancy, he was unlike any other. His eyes seemed to reflect the depths of oceans, while his smile could make even the most cynical heart believe in the goodness of the world. From his earliest days, it was evident that Attis was no ordinary being. He was destined for a life both fascinating and tragic. Sibylle, captivated by Attis's extraordinary beauty and grace, found herself entranced in a manner unbefitting of a goddess. But the love was far from simple. It was a cosmic pull, an attraction that transcended the earthly and divine boundaries. Despite her regal status and untold powers, Sibylle experienced vulnerability, a yearning that was simultaneously uplifting and devastating. Attis was unaware of the love Sibylle bore him. In time, Attis saw the king of Pacinus's beautiful daughter, fell in love, and wished to marry her. The goddess Sibylle became insanely jealous and drove Attis mad as revenge. Running crazy through the mountains, Attis stopped at the foot of a pine tree, and there Attis castrated himself, spilling his lifeblood onto the earth. The red that soaked the soil became a forever reminder of shattered love. Witnessing the ghastly consequences of her wrath, Sibylle was overcome with regret and sorrow. Consumed by her own heartache, she reached out with her divine powers to ensure that Attis's earthly form would remain imperishable. His body morphed into an evergreen tree, impervious to the decay that claims all mortal beings. In this way, Sibylle bestowed upon Attis a bittersweet form of eternity, rendering him a lasting monument to a love that had descended into tragedy. The tale of Sibylle and Attis not only served as a poignant narrative, but also gave birth to the annual festival known as Hilaria. Taking place during the vernal equinox, this festival was both a jubilant celebration and a somber commemoration. Rituals involved fasting, music, and ecstatic dancing, culminating in a day of mourning for Attis and a subsequent day of rejoicing to mark his symbolic resurrection. Well, there you have it. 
For more compelling stories, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and don't forget to tap the notification bell to stay tuned for any future episodes. Until next time, on the History Realm.